Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. Welcome. I recently watched several documentaries about the building of the Great Pyramid of Pharaoh Khufu at Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world. All of them point out that Khufu's pyramid required more than two million big stones, many of them weighing between two and eight tons. That's a lot of rock. Those stones had to be transported, sometimes from great distances, and hauled up the side of this monstrous pile of rock. Now, no one knows exactly how the pyramids were built, but all the Egyptologists seem to be in general agreement that there is no available evidence that the Egyptians of Khufu's time could transport those stones by wheeled vehicles. Why? Surely every adult with an IQ over 60 grasps the fact that round things roll and that rolling is a faster and easier method of movement than dragging or lifting. It seems like such an easy step to build some wheels and then develop carts and wagons. We must be missing something important. Is this a mystery that needs to be solved? I think so. TV detectives start by searching for fingerprints. Did the Egyptians leave any clues? Oh, wait, aren't there a lot of paintings on temple walls and tombs, like these, showing scenes from daily life? Do they show wheeled vehicles? Well, yes, but essentially all of them come from an era that's a thousand years or more after Khufu. Khufu left no pictures. He did not even leave a sculpture of himself. So for convenience, let's just pretend that this drawing from a temple wall is Khufu. Now the question, had wheels been invented when Khufu lived? Here's the oldest wheel that has been discovered so far. It's not the first wheel ever built. It's just the oldest one that was miraculously preserved for 5,000 years. It came from Eastern Europe, near the top of the Adriatic Sea, and was radiocarbon dated to 3,200 BC, give or take 100 years. That's about 600 years before the construction of the Great Pyramid. So, old Khufu had plenty of time to wake up to the wheel fad. Actually, he had a lot more time than that, because there's fragmentary evidence that wheels were in use around 4,000 B.C. in the Middle East. Had wheels changed by the time Pharaoh Khufu dreamed up the pyramid in 2600 B.C.? Here's a picture of the earliest war wagon I could find. It came from the tomb of the king of Sumeria, who died in 2550, 16 years after Khufu died. Check out the wheel technology. These wagons still had solid slab wheels made from two pieces of wood, just like the wheels from 600 years earlier. These wheels revolve independently around a fixed axle, which is a better design than earlier wheels. It looks like the joinery might be a couple of metal strips, so maybe that's also an advance. But if you think these wheels would support a weight of, say, three tons, then you'd be dreaming. These pictures came from a mosaic intended to honor the accomplishments of the king, who lived at the same time as Khufu. The Sumerians were highly civilized and had developed a much more efficient writing system than Egypt. Evidently, the king was really proud of these war wagons because there were five of them shown on the mosaic. I think it's reasonable to believe that they were the state of the art. Then it's a pretty good bet that the carts used by the Egyptian army had similar wheels. However, please note that these are not chariots. They are primitive farm wagons that could not be steered. Let me say that again. No steering. The team had to drag the wagon around tight turns, making the wheels skid sideways. How durable do you think those wheels were? How awkward were they? How fast could it go? Let's talk about what else is wrong with solid wheels. Slab wheels are still being made today. They break the same rules for wood grain management as crude shed doors. And everyone's familiar with them. So let's start there. An untrained farmer lines up several boards of appropriate length. In order to join the pieces, he nails two or more horizontal boards across the width of the door. A few saw cuts and a little bit of hammering, and he's got a door that will fit the opening. It's fast, cheap, and requires no special tools. What's not to like? Well, the boards will inevitably shrink across their width. The cross pieces interfere with this shrinkage because their grain runs the opposite way. The door will develop gaps, splits, and cracks, and very likely will eventually warp and distort. We have thousands of years of experience with these doors. They work, but they have limitations. 
If a modern trained woodworker took on this job, they would start by building a frame and then would fill the central opening with boards that float in a slot in the frame. The long grain around the perimeter reduces warping and adds dimensional stability. All the wood movement problems would disappear, and the maker could reasonably expect that this door would remain flat and intact for decades, maybe a century. Now back to slab wheels. You start the same way as the door. Draw a circle and cut it out. Next, nail on some battens, very much like the door. And just like that, you've turned a crappy door into a crappy wheel with the same violations of the rules of grain management. Please note that the strength of this wheel changes as the wood grain rotates. And picture what happens if you put a really massive load on that axle. A handful of nails is all that prevents splitting. Remember also that farm wagons drive across creeks, wallow through marshy ground, and sit outside in the rain and the snow, freezing and then eventually baking. This primitive wheel was all people had for 2,000 years. Pharaoh Khufu was stuck with the same kind of primitive wheels and carts as those in Samaria. As you might expect, they were pretty advanced for their time. Here's a wheel from France, dated from exactly the same time that Khufu lived. It's considerably more primitive. It's suitable for bringing cabbages in from the field, but probably not for many of Khufu's needs. Primitive wheels work for garden carts, specifically because they don't have to carry very much weight. But Khufu did not just need better wheels. He needed a complete heavy lift transport vehicle that could reliably handle the rocky, sandy terrain at Giza. I'll bet he ordered some extra big carts built. Did they work? Well, no one knows, but it's not hard for us to understand their limitations. Why might they fail? Axle strength, lack of metal bearings, there's so many possible reasons. My guess is that when they found out that massive carts could not be steered, they realized that they had limited utility for moving gigantic blocks of stone. You cannot drag these primitive wheels sideways while you're carrying a multi-ton load. Building a pivoting front axle capable of supporting a five-ton load turns out to be far more complex than you would guess and it demands advanced metallurgy that was just not available to Khufu. Now fast forward more than a thousand years. The date is now 1325 BC. Young Tutankhamun is the pharaoh, and the world has discovered chariots. We know this story firsthand because we discovered six real chariots that were preserved in King Tut's tomb. Not just drawings on a wall or words in a story. The real deal. By King Tut's day, all the powerful countries in the Middle East had chariots that could be used in warfare. This innovation appears to have originated in an advanced culture from the Ural Mountains, where a spoked wheel chariot was found in a burial site called Sintashta. It was dated at about 2100 BC, about 500 years after Khufu. We think the Hittites in Turkey brought this new military strategy to the Middle East a few hundred years later. Hittite armies were not invincible, but they were really formidable. The Bible mentions them several times, pointing out that their chariots outperformed anything the Israelites had. Egypt was naturally envious and began to just blatantly copy the Hittite design. Here's a picture from Egypt of a Hittite chariot. It held three warriors instead of two, but otherwise looked very much like King Tut's chariots. A chariot's not just another ponderous farm wagon. First, chariots had only two wheels, which makes them easy to steer. And they were light as a feather. Well, not really, but King Tut's chariot only weighed about 60 pounds or 27 kilos. The wheels were spidery thin on purpose. It was a quick, nimble, lightweight machine designed to go as fast as a galloping horse can carry it. They were used to conduct lightning assaults on the enemy moving so fast that they were hard for archers to hit. The primitive, wobbling wheels of Khufu's time would just not cut it. They needed a much improved design. To accomplish that, a whole new kind of wheel was needed. A wheel that was resilient, amazingly strong, and yet very lightweight. First, woodworkers quickly realized that they needed different grain direction and different dimensions in different parts of the wheel. 
In the same way that we use frame and panel construction to make strong doors that resist warping and seasonal wood movement, they needed a multi-part wheel design. The long grain in the rims runs around the entire circumference. It took many centuries to learn how to bend hardwood into a perfectly circular shape. The strong long grain holds the wheel together. Tests in my shop show that the long grain of common hardwoods is six to eight times as strong as the side grain. Ash, the same wood that's used for baseball bats, was popular because it was both tough and springy. Because of the optimal grain direction, the rim could be much thinner, which gives the wheel some resilience. Resilience is very important when you travel on rough ground at high speeds. Chariots were nicknamed bone shakers. The hub is made long enough that the wheel will not wobble on its axle. Wobbling is terrible when you're going fast. To reduce wobble, the hub needs to be much, much wider than the rim. The ideal wood was elm, which is very resistant to splitting. The long grain of the spokes is always oriented perpendicular to the rim at every point, no matter which way the wheel turns. Almost all the force on the spoke is compression in the direction in which the wood has its greatest strength and rigidity. If you want more resilience, you can make the spokes thinner, hoping that they will spring back after an impact like an archer's bow. Okay, that's the theory. Pulling it off is another story. For instance, how did the ancient Egyptians bore a big axle hole in the end grain of a piece of tough hardwood as long as your foot? As far as I know, the ship's auger, like this one, had not been invented. They would be turning a simple spade bit, and drilling holes the size of your forearm is not easy. I seriously doubt that a bow drill like the one in this painting could turn such a large bit. They undoubtedly had to invent new tools. The rim was made of one or two pieces of steam-bent wood. These require a steam box that's 3 meters or 10 feet long or maybe bigger. They require a big, heavy, full-size bending form rigidly attached to something unmovable. The wheel builders needed a very quick, very powerful clamping mechanism. and This was long before pipe clamps had been invented. Above all, they needed a lot of expertise. Most of you who have tried to bend hardwood into tight curves have at least one or two stories of total failures. Bending wood that's an inch and a half or 38 millimeters thick is often a frustrating experience. The technology to make highly accurate, perfectly circular, perfectly flat shapes in wood apparently took 2,000 years to evolve. The big developments in wheels were driven by warfare. Speed and maneuverability won battles. Both are really hard on wheels. At the speed of a running horse, a sharp turn exerts a huge sideways force. Massively thick, solid wheels could stand up to this force, but they're just way too heavy. Early spoked wheels had a wonderful strength-to-weight ratio, but they had a weakness. Side strength. Engineers call this axial load. If a sharp turn occurs on a smooth, hard surface, the wheel can often skid sideways until it starts rolling again. But if it's running in rocky or thick or sticky soil, the rim tends to be held in its rut while the hub is pushed sideways. If the force is large enough, the spokes will try to pull out of their mortises in the hub and in the rim. Without the spokes to reinforce it, the rim will collapse and the wheel will break. But once again, someone made a brilliant discovery that saved the day. It's a very small change in the way the wheel is built angle the spokes so that they are pointed slightly toward the outside of the wheel. We call this shape dish. It does not take much. In actual practice, only about two degrees of angulation is necessary for many common wheels. Once the rim is tightly in place, the geometry of this design powerfully resists any attempt to push the hub outward. It's the old triangle principle. Unless you break one of the sides, you cannot deform a triangle. The spoke resists any shortening, and the radius of the wheel cannot increase if the rim remains intact. If the rim is strong enough, then this new geometry makes the wheel much better at resisting side forces. This was another revolutionary innovation, a big increase in strength without any increase in weight. But dishing the wheels introduced its own problem. If the lower wheels do not meet the ground in a perfectly vertical fashion, the wheel will try to turn in the direction of the tilt, 
in the same way that you make turns on a bicycle or a motorcycle by leaning. Wheels that do not run straight fight each other and waste energy in a big way. So the solution was to angle the axle spindle downward and slightly forward. At the correct angle, the wheel runs true and the spokes can support their maximum load. However, this shape concentrates a lot of stress on the outboard end of the axle spindle. This results in rapid wear. Ancient wheelwrights eventually figured out a really clever solution. They tapered the axle spindles. The axle spindles evolved into a cone shape with the bottom side parallel to the ground and angled slightly forward. This required tapered holes in the wheel hubs that matched the shape. If this seems outrageously complicated, well, it was. Getting really good wheels was so much harder than the simplistic image you were shown in grade school. But this technology was so successful that it hardly changed in the next two or 3,000 years. In the Bronze Age, they added some metal refinements that reduced both wear and friction. First, they put metal hoops or rings around the hub to prevent splitting. Then they inlaid a strip of metal on the bottom of the axle spindle where most of the wear was concentrated. Later, they added a cone of cast metal inside the hub, which reduced both wear and friction. The final refinement was to cover the entire spindle with a cone of metal, called a skein, that mated with the cone in the hub, which was called the boxing. Now, enter the Iron Age. In maybe 12 or 1300 BC, near the reign of Tutankhamun, the Hittites finally perfected methods of producing iron and iron products in commercial quantities. They also learned how to do welding and a whole range of other critical blacksmithing techniques after centuries of trial and error. They appear to be the first army to realize that putting an iron tire around the rim increased the wheel strength enormously. They also eventually realized a trick that would be used by wheelwrights and blacksmiths for the next 3,000 years. They made iron tires that were just slightly smaller than the wooden rim of their chariot wheels. They then heated the iron tire in a fire, causing it to expand. After hammering the snug iron band onto the wheel, they quickly quenched the hot iron in water. The iron shrunk enough to place the whole wheel in strong compression. The combination of powerful compression and ditching the spokes made the wheels dramatically stronger and more reliable. You know that sign in your mechanic shop that says, Fast, Cheap, Good? Pick any two? Well, the sign in the chariot shop read, Fast, maneuverable, dependable. Pick any two. However, iron tires on the Hittite chariot rims changed that. They did add some weight, which slowed them down just a little. But they made the wheels able to tolerate almost any high-speed maneuvering. They sacrificed a little bit of speed for vastly better reliability and the ability to swerve to avoid a threat. The strength of the wheels took a giant step forward. But there's another huge benefit. Iron tires also allow the rim to be made of six or more thick pieces of hardwood, called fellows, which are sawn to the correct curve instead of steam bending. This allows you to build much stronger, thicker wheels, which are absolutely required for heavy loads. Kufu, I hope you're listening. If you want to carry eight-ton loads, you need iron tires. No iron? Yeah, that's a problem. So, suppose I sent this video to Pharaoh Khufu in 2600 BC. This is revolutionary information. Would this have changed everything for him? I don't think so. First, his craftsmen would have to invent a whole series of tools needed for these advanced wheels. Then they needed years of experience building these much more complex structures. You don't really think a person could learn the whole wheelwright trade by simply watching 15 minutes of animation, do you? Then some clever people would have to invent a heavy lift steering mechanism. Here's a photo of a very light duty front axle. I can see more than 50 separate parts, not counting the wheels. Is this a lot more complicated than you imagined? Finally, to get the strength to carry truly massive stones, the Egyptians would need to develop the ability to smelt, forge, and weld iron. Wooden wagons that can reliably carry 8 to 10 tons need a lot of heavy metal reinforcement and parts. 
Khufu would have been dead for 500 years before this dream even started to come true. But this raises an interesting question. Could it have been done? Is it even possible to build wooden wagons strong enough to carry the huge stone blocks of the pyramid over rough ground and sand? It turns out that it has been done. In the late 1800s, the mineral borax was discovered in a remote part of the Mojave Desert in California, an arid terrain that is similar to the Sahara Desert at Giza. The ore had to be transported about 165 miles, or 270 kilometers, to the nearest railroad line. The mine had two giant wagons specially built. Each weighed about four tons when empty and could carry 10 tons of ore. These wagons still exist, but of course they're no longer functional. For an historical reenactment, a wheelwright in Montana named Dave Engel was commissioned to build exact replicas, faithful in every detail. He's made a series of videos showing the process in great detail. It's eye-opening to see just how challenging this build was, even with the help of modern power tools. I've borrowed a few of Dave's images to illustrate this video. Thanks, Dave. And finally, think about all the people who ask the apparently simple question, when was the whip invented? They clearly do not understand the complexity and sophistication of wheels. Obviously, we woodworkers should be writing this part of history. Okay, maybe wheelwrights and wainwrights and blacksmiths who are actually experts should be writing this story. What do I know? All I want to say is that wheels capable of carrying gigantic loads were not invented in a single flash of brilliance. They evolved at a painfully slow pace. It took thousands of trial and error experiments by thousands of craftsmen conducted over several thousand years. This has been a very different kind of video for me. If you liked it, leave me a comment. If I've piqued your interest in wheels, please check out the videos at Engel's Coat Shop, linked in the description below. He's an incredibly versatile craftsman and fun to watch. As always, thanks for watching.